go. Ryan, now we're actually recording the show, so that's good. <laughs> are, are we, Tom? I don't are know. We? I hope so. <laughs> For everyone listening, we had we were about ten minutes into the show then, and we were getting some really good shit. And then I'm like, oh wow, I'm actually not recording the show. So now we're recording. And it's lovely to have my good friend officially on the show, Ryan Hassan. Welcome, my friend. <laughs> Tom, I'm, it's such a pleasure to be here again. <laughs> yeah, it feels like hey, don't, you, don't you love when you're on like a five-minute monologue going off <laughs> and then all of a sudden you see the recording little symbol pop up I'm like, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, man, I'm so sorry. That's hilarious. That it, hilarious. Mate, it's funny. It's funny. It's it's the things that happen with uh, with you know, being online and being digital and that kind of thing. Like I had one the other day, I was recording a uh, podcast with my mate Nick and we had a guest on and luckily it was at the start of the show, but like a couple of minutes in, bang, power went out. Oh, and yeah. Everything was lost. And like, <laughs> there's nothing you can do. No, exactly. It, it is funny. I think um, the stuff we were getting into before about root cause work is, I, I, I'm going to segue it now actually, because I, 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 what I'm so fascinated with for you, as, as much as being a friend, you've also got this incredible um, story that is so congruent to trauma work because there's there's an element of subjectivity there that is like a real spanner in the works. People think of trauma, as you mentioned just before, before we were recording, it's like sexual abuse and going to war and all this sort of stuff. But what happened to you and what it led to, you know, I think is a really brilliant story. So, mate, for, for everyone that doesn't know, short introduction. And then um, could you get into your story? Because uh, And especially the way you say it is, the way you speak about it is really, really cool too. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I'll get into my story in a minute because what mine's one of um, not understanding that as human beings, we're all traumatized to some yes. degree. And yes, like we say the word trauma and we have certain associations of sexual abuse, physical abuse, someone who was in a car crash, someone who, yes, was uh, serving for our country and saw some horrific things. Um, but we all as human beings suffer from trauma. It just, we're on a spectrum from here to there. We're not, it's not an on or off switch. It's like people with depression. It's like, do I have depression or not? Do I have anxiety or not? Am I addicted to something or not? It's like, we're all on that spectrum somewhere. It's at, at what point does that become an issue and really start to affect our lives? Mm. And so um, for me, uh, my story, or one of struggling with anxiety uh, as a kid, probably from about the age of 10, I'd say. I feel like around grade four-ish was where it came on. Now, back then, I never had this language. You know, I wouldn't yeah. have known what the word anxiety meant. Um, so I just it's, it's in hindsight, looking back, that I knew I would just have these great feelings of fear, these great feelings of uh, dread, I would call it, from time to time, like something bad was going to happen. And this happened in social situations with sport, with all, all sorts of stuff and sort of, we were a family that, you know, very, very loving family, but never spoke about, you know, our emotional state and what was happening internally. You know, it was about what was happening at school with friends, with sport. And so I just internalized and internalized and internalized. Now, funnily enough, a lot of people have learned internalizing doesn't make the problem any better. Really? <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. Lesson number one. Yeah. Uh, so... So this anxiety sort of just kept feeding on itself because it wasn't getting expression. I mean, anxiety is uh, not some sort of fault with us as a human being. It's feedback. We're getting some sort of feedback that something is incongruent, something needs to change in our life or our perceptions need to change. Now, obviously, being very young, I didn't know that. So over time, this anxiety sort of got more and more and more until the age I was a teenager and I found alcohol. Nice. Well, guess what alcohol did? It made the anxiety go away quite a bit <laughs> in the moment. You know, I was like, hey, this liquid over here, when I have that, that anxiety comes down. I start to feel more connected to people. I can connect on a deeper level. Um, so it was serving a purpose. So like many, many people, you know, binge drinking throughout my teenage years, um, not understanding that uh, it it was covering up a lot of this deep feeling of anxiety that I had. On my 20th birthday, I found uh, illicit drugs. I started using ecstasy and speed. Well, I thought the alcohol did a good job. These did an even better job. <laughs> These did a fantastic job. I felt like all all those barriers and walls that I had up around myself causing all this fear came down and I could really connect with people, mainly my friends. Um, I found myself feeling, you know, it was so interesting. It's always hindsight looking back. It used to mm. baffle me at the time, but I never thought about it too much. But I would obviously go out with friends and we would do ecstasy, you know, go out clubbing and that kind of jazz. And I would watch them and it would fascinate me because they'd go out, take a few pills, have a great time, you know, wonderful, and then not really think about it 
for a few months. And then in a few months, it might be someone's birthday and they do it again. Whereas me, the first ecstasy tablet I took, I was like, this is the most incredible thing I've ever felt in my life. I'm going to do this as much as possible for the foreseeable future. Right? That's smart. It's the exact same, <laughs> it's the exact same substance, yes. but there was a different relationship there. It wasn't until later I found out that because I had this really deep feeling of anxiety and dread that it was alleviating, it was solving more of a problem than for me, mm. right? Um, which is where a lot of people get stuck. They think, you know, a drug problem is about the drug. It's not about the drug. <laughs> the drug is, is an attempt for us to solve whatever deeper issue we have going on. Hmm. So I spent most of my 20s using recreational drugs quite heavily. I would call myself a functional addict. I still held down a job as a tradesman. I don't know how sometimes because <laughs> basically I would I would come in the Monday through Wednesday I was basically a zombie. I could hardly function. I would kind of come good by Thursday and then Friday night it would be on again and that yeah. happened. Uh, many, many, many times. But throughout that time, I was able to hold down a job. I fell in love. I got married. We got a house, a mortgage, dog, white picket fence, all that kind of stuff. None of which truly satisfied me. I was the classic man who wore this mask that everything's okay and I'm living a fantastic life. So family, friends, um, you know, people would come to me for advice and just say, you know, you're killing it and doing all this blah, blah, blah. But I wasn't. That was all a front that I was putting on because internally I was struggling deeply and that struggle was leading to binging on drugs and alcohol for a long, long time. Uh, 2014, my marriage fell apart, um, something I didn't see coming. This was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. From this point, it's like, it's like I'd just been holding together a semblance of a life <laughs> up until that point. I think a lot of people struggle with that feeling. It's like we, we're just holding on, mm. right? It's like just holding on to what? That's mm. interesting to, to think about that. But like we're, we're just keeping it together. Uh, I, I stopped keeping it together from that point. After the marriage breakup, I started using ice and GHB very heavily. Um, that very heavily went to every day. And I just became a full-blown drug addict. I ended up living out in a drug house in the eastern suburbs, a place where... Uh, people came and went all the time. No one really slept. I ran through whatever money I had very, very quickly, as you do in that world, and started dealing to support my habit. So my whole days were revolved around uh, buying, selling, and using drugs. That was it. It's a very simple life. It's a very mm. chaotic life, fulfilled with drama, but it is very, very simple when you think about your goals. Mm. Uh, I'd shut out my close friends and family. Uh, so much guilt and shame comes with being a drug addict that... Uh, people show that in different ways. Oftentimes people go the reverse and seem very uh, arrogant and like they don't care. I'm yet to meet a drug addict who isn't riddled with guilt and shame. Mm. Um, for me, my coping mechanism was just shutting out my friends and family and not letting them see the person that I'd become. So I didn't speak to them for a period of time, which was very, uh, very odd because I'm extremely close with my family, especially my parents, mm. um, but was a struggling at that time. So being in that world, things happen. You know, your, your tolerance for the drug goes higher and higher. So you're using just incredible amounts. I was overdosing on GHB every second day. One of those was at the wheel of my car, which I rode into a wall on a freeway. And um, luckily no one else was hurt. Thank God. Uh, I was arrested a couple of times. Um, many, many moments along that journey that were, uh, rock bottoms, as you would call it. Uh, the one when I got arrested the first time and I was sitting in a jail cell looking at those white walls and you have that moment where you're like, think about your whole life up until that point and you're like, how the bloody hell did I end up here? Yeah. What, where did this go wrong? Yeah. And for me, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but for me, and I've worked with so many addicts or people with mental illness who struggle with this because there hasn't been a trauma in a significant sense like, it's like, hey, if I was sexually abused when I was eight and that went for four years and now I'm a drug addict, I can point back to that and go, that's probably got a, a lot to do with it. Totally. If I don't have any <clears throat> significant event like that or consciously significant event, I look back on my life and go, I'm such a fuck up. I don't deserve, who am I to be in this situation? And we start beating ourselves up further, right? And start comparing ourselves to other people. Um, there was another moment on that journey, which was, which was quite significant because I'd shut my close friends out as well. And they had somehow... Uh, found out where I was living in this drug house and two of my best mates rocked up to the house one day and I'll never forget it was such an interesting moment it was normally there was people in this house everywhere there were always people there, but for whatever reason at this time I was there by myself and there was my dog and um, I heard a knock at the door and I immediately freaked out we didn't like unexpected knocks at the door at that house <laughs> okay we, it's an automatic anxiety response yeah. you know, I didn't answer it didn't answer the door. And then I, my phone started lighting up and I could see my mate Phil and, and Matt out the front. And they were messaging saying, mate, we're at the front door. Like, come to the door. And uh, I 
they hadn't seen me in the house. I mean, they saw my car out the front. Uh, in that moment, I had my two best friends literally a few meters on the other side of a door knocking because they just wanted to see me and wanted to help me with my situation. In that moment, I decided to crawl from the bedroom out to the hallway, which is the only area of the house with no windows, and just sit in that hallway with my hands over my head like this, just waiting for them to stop knocking and to go away. That's the uh, the guilt and shame that comes uh, with being a drug addict. Wow. So... From that point, after this, you know, riding my car off, being arrested a couple of times, um, I'd lost all my worldly possessions. Um, High-speed car chases. There's like, a, there's a book there. You have to teach me how to write, Tom, so I can write a book about this stuff. <laughs> do, <laughs> please do. Yep. <laughs> I will at some point. And um, it got to a point where I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to start reaching out for help. It's a very, very dark place when you're deep in addiction because you can't see your way out. And it's like, it's kind of like you don't want a way out either. Because you can't see your way out, you resign yourself to the fact that this is your life. But because I had serious criminal charges in a court case coming up and I was looking at some some decent jail time, I was like, I've got to try and, you know, sort myself out. I um was looking at rehab. It's like classic drug addicts, like you Google. Go, mm. Google rehab. I've I've heard people say they go to rehab when they're addicted <laughs> to drugs. Uh, what I found out was there's basically stay in rehab, private and public. Uh Private rehab, thirty plus thousand dollars. I certainly didn't have that kind of money, and I certainly wasn't going to put that back on my parents. Mm. After I got arrested the second time, I did let my parents back in and my friends, which was the first step, basically. Um, which was, yeah, a very very tough moment. I remember I had friends in that drug world uh, at the time, and after I got arrested and lost all money and drugs and everything, they stopped contacting me. And I'm like, and then I was going through my phone this one night looking at all these messages from like the last six months or so from close friends going, mate, where are you? And they, they were there for me and I just ignored all of them. And I had this moment where I'm like, I've, I've left them behind for these people. Like, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. So that's when I reached out. And I, I consider myself insanely fortunate because in that world, a lot of people shut people out for so long when they really want help. The people are like, get fucked. You <laughs> haven't spoken to us for so long. Like, mm. you know, you've chosen drugs over us. I was lucky. My friends and family welcomed me back with open arms, um, which is a lot of people don't have. I remember going back and seeing my mum and dad for the first time. And that was very, very hard experience. I remember kind of, you know, mum's crying and telling her your son's a drug addict, a drug dealer. He's on criminal charges. All this kind of stuff was uh, very difficult. I remember at the time when I was explaining it, I was talking about it kind of like I was in the third person. It's like mm. this dissociation tactic. I remember my dad saying, do you understand how serious this is? I'm like, yeah, I'm not serious, but like, I can't, <laughs> you I can't there. deal with it. Yeah. Mm. I wasn't there. Yeah. I'm so yep. used to escaping. <clears throat> plus I was, plus I was high at the time. Um, and so I started, did this Google. So, Private rehab, way too much money. Public rehab uh, in Victoria at the time was a six-month waiting list. I'm like, Jesus Christ, I, I'm going to be in jail or dead in three months. <laughs> so uh, six months, I just don't have. So I ended up finding a uh, place in Dandenong, eastern, southeastern suburbs of Melbourne. It's like a through a government company, but it's like a home-based detox. So essentially, you do it from home but you get some help. You get like a care and recovery worker, a nurse that checks in. Uh, they'll set you up with a doctor, um, psychologist, that kind of jazz. So I did that. I got clean at home. That wasn't, you know, it was hard, but I'd got clean so many times before. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, that's what it's, people, they're obsessed with this first little detox period and all that. And they think once they're through that, it's fine. Mm. Drug addiction isn't about stopping drugs. It's about staying stopped. Yeah. The, 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 physical, the physical hook of a drug is like this, the mental and emotional side is everything, right? That's why so many people, they, you go to a private rehab and you'll spend one month, three months, six months in a facility and you get ticked off as clean. It's like, no shit, you're clean. You've been in a facility for three months, yeah. right? Because we think once that physical hook of the drug's gone, they're going to be okay. Well, 90% of people relapse after they get out because their mental and emotional reasons haven't been dealt with. Mm. So uh, I did this detox. I was 12 days clean. And uh, then I relapsed, so got back on it. Uh, that lasted a week, and that week sort of turned out to be the most important of my life. You know, during that week, my care and recovery worker had set me up to see a psychologist. And I was kind of, I know it was weird. Part of me was like I wanted to get some stuff off my chest. I didn't know what I was going to get off my chest, but um, it's weird. Like it's, When you're in that state, there's something I haven't spoken about much. It's like your ego has taken such a hit right? Because you could imagine you're, you're looking at yourself in the mirror and you're like, I'm a drug addict. I'm like 15 kilos 
lighter than I normally am. I look like shit. Um, all this stuff's going on. You've shut out your friends and family. And the ego, for a lot of us men, our ego will still try and find something in that moment. It won't completely dissolve and you'll just mm. admit defeat and surrender, which would be the right thing to do at that time. <laughs> the ego is so strong that you take pride in how fucked up you are. So I was actually looking forward to speaking to a psychologist just to let them know how fucked up I was because it was more than other people, surely, right? Yeah. This is the, the, how rampant the ego is. It's, it's so funny looking back on it. Um, wow. So basically, I was set up with this psychologist and I'd let my friends and family back in. I was telling all them, I'm seeing this psychologist Friday, Friday. It's all booked in, looking forward to talking to someone. Um, Friday, Friday, Friday is when this thing was. Anyway, Thursday morning, 10 o'clock, I'm going through my phone, off my face again, just deleting old text messages. And I had this text message from earlier in the week from my care and recovery worker just saying, uh, just that reminder, I've booked you in for Thursday at 9 a.m. for that psychologist. Now, this is Thursday at 10 a.m. And I'm like, what the fuck? I swear it was Friday. Like, I swear. Like, I was real weird. So I was beating myself up because I just missed this appointment. Literally less than an hour later, I get a random message on Facebook from an old acquaintance, someone, you know, I met at a talk years before. I knew she was a therapist, but no idea what she did. Uh, Melissa, who's now, it's a whole other story. She's my business partner. She's my partner. We have a son together. Anyway, uh, we'll get to that. Yes, <laughs> um, yes. She, she, Don't she reaches away. down. Just get, <laughs> Don't, don't give away the ending. Uh, yeah. I, I, I lived. I survived. So true, true. <laughs> true, true. I'm, you didn't die? A, I'm not a whole, I'm a hologram. No. Yeah. Uh, so she reaches out and just goes, Hey, what's been going on? You know, how you been? And, uh, classical me, I just deflect, deflect. I never wanted to talk about what was going on for me internally, just because I never had throughout my whole life. I found out later that I had a belief that I can't be vulnerable in front of people. So if I can't be vulnerable, I'll never show somebody that I'm struggling. That's why everyone in my life thought that I was killing it and doing mm. fantastic. So I just said, yeah, yeah. I, it's been an eventful past year or so. <laughs> That's why the words I use. But anyway, on to you. How's business going? How are you? Blah, blah. Anyway, a bit of back and forth and I'm like, oh, the conversation's done. And then she shoots me just one more message because oh, I feel a lot of hurt in your heart. And I'm like, can't, I can't disagree with that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. And then she said to me, oh, you're a Pisces, aren't you? And I'm like, yeah. She goes, oh, you like putting other people's uh, happiness over your own. And then that's something that was weird because I'd just been thinking about that concept the previous day or so. So Whoa. she said these two things that just sort of resonated very deeply. I'm like, all right, what's where, where are you going with this? You know, witch doctor. Yeah. And, uh, and then she said to me, hey, would you be up for just doing this quick little exercise? I'm like, yeah, whatever. I'm not doing anything else, <laughs> right? So she goes, grab a pen and paper and um, I want you to write something down for me. And it was weird because I was sitting in this, the place I was living with a laptop and there was some other dude we were using drugs. And I, was, I grabbed the laptop and I'm like, I'm going to my room. I'll be back soon. I'm talking to this girl about something. He's like, yeah. oh yeah, whatever. Nice. And so anyway, I got this bit of paper. She said, look, just are you, what handed are you writing? I said, I'm left-handed. She goes, use your right hand and just start to write down just a couple of emotions. Like, just tell me what you're feeling. Just like tune into your body and just let it go on paper what you're, you're feeling. Now, it was so interesting what came out of me because I'm someone who I basically ignored negative emotions my entire life. I was addicted to positive emotions. I was addicted to feeling upbeat, joy, uh, ecstasy, all the bliss. All, I was obsessed with it. That's why I became a drug addict. Mm. Whenever I was feeling lower emotions, I needed to change that immediately because I hated it. Um, so I never acknowledged them. I just escaped. So writing down, I was writing things like defeated, broken, uh, dead inside, sad, scared. And it's weird because when you write with your uh, non-dominant hand, it's real like squiggly. It looks like a child's writing, um, which is kind of what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> There's a scared child in there, right? And so anyway, I wrote this stuff down and it was this moment I just went, whoa. It sort of stirred something up like that. So look, I've, for someone who's never acknowledged anything like that, to actually acknowledge what you're really feeling mm -hmm. um, is, is quite confronting. So that stirred something up in me and I said, all right, can I come see you for a session? No idea what she did. And um, she's like, yeah, I might have a spot available next week. And I'm like, no, no, tomorrow. I need to see you tomorrow. Because that was the Friday. I had Friday burnt in my mind. And then a, a couple yeah. of minutes later, she goes, I've literally just had a cancellation. Someone just messaged me and they've canceled tomorrow. So yeah, you can come in at whatever time it was. So I was like, hey, I don't believe in much in my life at this point, but I'm going to go. 
I'm going to go tomorrow. So I walked in the next day. Uh, I had no idea what she did. She had no idea I was a drug addict. Uh, she admitted later when I walked in, she was like, whoa, because she'd seen me a few years before and I was about 15 kilos lighter um, than what I was then. And just in a just in a disheveled state, she goes, the clothes you were wearing. And I'm like, it was so funny because before I went there, I was making a real effort to try and dress up nice. <laughs> this is the state <laughs> oh, that I was no. in. <laughs> I, I walked That's down to this place going, this is the most I've dressed up in the last year. I look fantastic. <laughs> She's like, you look fucking horrible. Yeah. And, um, oh, anyway, I, I got in there and um, I spent about three hours in her office and we spoke about drugs for about two minutes at the start. And she explained it. She said, look, you've got so much of these heavy emotions down here that you've escaped from and not dealt with throughout your entire life that you're seeking drugs to block those out. Yeah, wow. so whenever you stop, they will come back to the surface. When you stop, they will come back to the surface and you can never win that battle. And I was at a point where I used so many drugs, they were barely even suppressing them anymore. Like it wasn't, mm. a drug addict knows that. It's like you're not even taking drugs to get high anymore. You're taking them just to not feel the crippling come down that comes uh, after it. So it's like a really a no-win situation. We then jumped into uh, my traumas that I didn't know that I had. Wow. <laughs> yeah. so we, we found out that the, the two big things we worked on that day which really just lightened the load for me so tremendously were two beliefs that i have our, our whole world is made up of what we believe we filter our reality through our belief systems we all have our own individual set of beliefs that's what makes us a little bit different when two people argue it's not two people arguing it's just a, a um a challenging of belief systems that's arguing with each other mm. yeah i mean but, but People have wars over their belief systems, right? And all, all belief systems are false, which we can get into that, right? <laughs> Breaking that down. But at this point, I basically, after chatting to Melissa, found out that I had a belief that I couldn't be vulnerable, like I mentioned, which meant I just couldn't let my walls down for anyone. Like I hadn't cried for 10 years, possibly 15 before this point. I was about 30 then, and I just hadn't cried. Like just, I didn't realize that was extremely unhealthy to yeah. let, 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 not let yourself cry. Because that whole cultural thing, like, hey, boys don't cry. Yeah, very mentally ill boys don't cry. Yes. Um, I had a belief that I can't be vulnerable. I also had a belief that not only didn't I love myself, I hated myself. Hmm. Like I genuinely hated who I was as a person and not just because from when I was a drug addict, but from years before as well. Um, my ego would tell me like I was into affirmations and stuff. Like I love myself. I'm awesome. All that kind of stuff. My subconscious programming was a deep seated hatred for who I was as a person. Um, that's quite confronting to find out. But then Melissa said to me, look, that's what we get to work on. So we jumped back into when these belief systems started. Every belief that we have about ourselves starts in a single event, a very, uh, an event with a very strong, heavy emotion attached happens and we create the belief system in order for us to try and cope with the rest of our life after that because we don't want to feel the heaviness of that emotion quite to the same degree again now the funny thing is we do it as a protection mechanism in the moment but it creates so much heartache later in life because you know like I said, if I have a belief that I can't be vulnerable, it might protect me in that moment, but then moving forward, it becomes super destructive because now I haven't had an outlet for decades after that. And same with the uh, not loving myself. So we jumped back into a couple of memories where I, where I created those beliefs, um, things that... I remember the two events, one when I was four, the other one when I was around that age as well. One memory was one I did know about consciously because myself and my family would joke about it all the time. Like it was quite a funny event when it happened, um, which I'll get into in a minute. The other one was something that I hadn't near thought of in decades that was sort of mm. stuck in that subconscious and controlling a lot of my life. But yeah, one of them was when I was four, my brother's uh, 14 years older than me, right? Um, so he was 18 and he fucking amazing. I, I, he was like my hero like i was look, my brother was everything because he would like kick the footy with me play cricket with me when and looking back on it i'm like how much fun is that for an 18 year old to play with a four-year-old like but i was having the time of my life right so anyway he's 18 he brings home uh the new girlfriend to meet the family right and this is now his wife and they've got kids who are like 21 and 23 wow. um so he brings her home and he's met my mum and dad and everything but i hid under the coffee table and I, I would not talk to her, right? I just, I just hid under the coffee table. And we, it, it became just this big joke because we're like, me and Donna, we're such good friends now. And we always joke we're under the coffee table and yeah. you know, it comes up from time to time. So I always had it like consciously that it was just this kind of funny thing that happened. But um, we went back into that event and it was uh, very, very traumatic for me, mm -hmm. right? Because I saw her as this is the person that's going to take my brother away. And my brother mm -hmm. was my whole world. And she wow. was the one who was going to take him away. And so we had to do some work where I had to actually sit with and process that emotion that was stuck all those years prior 
And we also did some work, what we call inner child work. And I actually went down and spoke to that four-year-old and helped him understand uh, what's going on. Yeah, because all this, all this trauma work is you have to deal with the energy, the emotion, right? Which is the most important. You have to actually be with it a hundred percent because the emotion's stuck. Yeah. And then we have to, once that's dealt with, we can start to actually reframe the experience because we can't reframe the experience without dealing with the emotion because mm. the emotion's so strong. It, it, like we think we're rational, critical thinking human beings we're run by our emotions like so so completely run by our emotions so that's why if you go back and start to talk about it or just reframe an experience it's like that conscious mind's going okay i get it i'm moving that way but the subconscious and emotional body is moving that way and whenever you're in dissonance and pulling in both ways that subconscious and that emotional body will win that win that battle every single time yeah that's why we're like when people say I shouldn't be feeling like this, or someone said that, and I shouldn't be feeling that way. She never said that. You are feeling that way, and there's a reason for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I was able to unpack those. So when I broke down that I can't be vulnerable, one that was just huge for me because when I broke down that belief system, guess what I did? I started bawling my eyes out like wow. you would not believe. <laughs> so you'd imagine this ten to fifteen years of built up, unexpressed sadness and tears just came pouring out of me like completely pouring out of me i wept i was just weeping for i don't even know how long i can't remember that was so confronting at first but my god did i feel good after that mm. right? this, this 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 pent up energy leaving the body when i was then able to deal with the belief that i didn't love myself and actually accept myself that was the moment for me that i didn't need to use drugs anymore because when i realized I'd made this decision about myself that wasn't true. Like, how how dare a four, five year old, eight year old kid ever decide that they don't love themselves as a human? We would never, we would never condemn another human being to that. Yeah, mm. but we do that to ourselves, not consciously, but subconsciously. Mm. And so once I dealt with that, I just had this moment where everything, this anxiety, like you'd imagine, it's like this clenching or this just holding on to a a, a bird rope or something. It's just happened my whole life. All of a sudden, that just loosened. And it's like I took the first deep breath from since before I had this anxiety when I was nine or so, you know? And um, in that moment, it's like the first time I felt present with who I was or the first time I accepted myself as who I was in all this time. And I remember there was like this moment of silence, right? And like, because I have my eyes shut through this process, I'm doing all this internal work. And then Melissa said to me, oh, what's happening now? And I remember I had this tear run down my face and I'm like... I'm completely and utterly with myself and there's nowhere else I'd rather be. And I, st I still get tingles talking about it now because in that moment, that was when I knew I no longer need for drugs because drugs are an attempt to escape ourselves, right? Why do I want to escape myself? Because I'm in too much suffering. I'm in too much pain. When that pain and suffering stops, there's no longer a need to escape. So that's why I always say to people, it's not about the drug, it's about the pain. So from that moment... I left her office like I was like, whoa, <laughs> that was fucking intense, <laughs> right? So, so I remember I went up on the eyes and stared at the wall. I don't know how long I was staring. And um, Blister even said to me, she goes, that was better than drugs, isn't it? I'm like, that's way better than drugs, <laughs> right? But that's, it's like, we, we've got this void. Like I've talked about this before, this void as a drug addict. Not even drug addicts. A lot of people feel this. So I've got this void and I'm trying to go through my life trying to fill it. And some people use drugs, some people use alcohol, some people use food, some people use gambling, some people use sex, some people use relationships, right? But it's just an attempt to try and fill up this void in us. And we're trying to use external means to do it. And even though you might find something that works, I found drugs worked best for me, trying to fill that void. But it still never fills it completely. You know, it might fill it halfway, right? But you're still craving the other half and you keep going harder and harder. And you've heard the term like chasing the dragon. It's just trying to fill up that void nothing external can do that right so that mm -hmm. that feeling of, of peace and acceptance for myself is what completely filled up that cup so now i don't need to fill it up anymore so i left her office and i'm like i spent the next day day and a half cutting ties with everyone in that uh scene uh the girl i was dating who was a drug addict as well i broke up with her all the people that owed me money i'm like yeah you don't owe me money anymore we're all good catch you later you're not going to see me for a while and then i went home and slept for four days which is what happens when you're an ice addict <laughs> wow. uh, yeah, and then it was from there that I got very curious about what other stuff I had going on in here. So I just wanted to keep unpacking and unpacking and unpacking um, so that I could just keep, you know, f feeling 
it's just it's like you, you, you it's like Pandora's box, which I found out. This stuff never stops. But at the time, it's like you just want to keep removing a lot of these old blocks because in those moments you realize that all this stuff that you think has been in your way has just been yourself in your own way, which is basically your belief systems and emotions blocking you from being the person that you want to be. And so I, I kept doing all that. I had the epiphany after maybe about a month or so after that it opened up a center at some point to help people who were in my situation. And then uh, it was a lot of study, uh, a lot of courses, a lot of books, a lot of videos, a lot of all that, a lot of practice. And then um, March of 2016, we opened up the center for healing. And that obviously ran for nearly four years and still running now online until we closed last year. So and that, that, that process has been helping people with addictions and mental illness or people that are just struggling in general, you know. Man, that, you know, you, you've, you, uh, the first time I heard that story, I really was um, blown away. I think just because of your, your wisdom, your vulnerability, um, the, like the way you say it, um, it really just engrosses me. Yeah, it's just a, I, I would love for you to write that book, man. <laughs> I think it's so One important. Time. When, when I've got time, yeah? I need yeah. a bit of time, don't I, Tom? Writing takes time, yeah? Writing does take a lot of time. That's true. It's very fun, but it's, um, yeah, dude, just the way you say, I just can't thank you enough for, for, for describing that to us all. And it's just incredible. Um, you know, what, what speaks to me most now, um, second time around, is the turnaround. Like for you to have an experience like that, for, for drugs to be such a major portion of your life for so long. And then in three hours, that, that switch, you know, um, does that, I mean, obviously you know what goes on there, but like, does it still, um, is it still staggering for you? Um, is it staggering? Yes. Yes. I think now one of the things you have to do, and I heard this really early on, right? And it was funny enough, the doctor that I went and saw as part of this home-based detox um, was a really a, a, a brilliant man. He was, uh, <laughs> he was trapped in the system, which had taken a lot of his life force, and all he did was prescribe me antipsychotics so I could sleep. But he was actually, he was actually deeply... He actually was the person... You, you're, uh, you know Johan Hari? Mm-hmm. Uh, chasing the scream so this doctor's one who put me on to chasing the scream all those years ago and um which was a great book as well but he said something to me because i said i'm going to open up this center i was real fired up and he just said look not everyone will get clean they'll say my you got clean and i took that on board uh big time and um that's why after this i started getting in touch with every person i knew who had gotten clean and found out how and it's funny mm. it, whatever method they used whatever method they used you know some was 12 step which i'm I'm both a fan and a critic of. Uh, some was just psychology. Some was going to rehab. Someone just woke up one day and went, fuck, I've had enough. What I found out, there was commonalities and it's similar to what I experienced, but maybe it's not on a grand scale. Like, you know, they didn't like, I honestly felt like I merged with the universe at that moment. And there was, there was no, all the perceived problems I had weren't actually problems. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? yeah, now, yeah. Not everyone has that kind of experience. So I consider myself fortunate in that respect. But it's like, people will turn it around when they're ready and they're in enough suffering to do so. Now, when we are like really deep, because I was so deep in that scene and everything, you feel like the deeper you get, the further you get away from where you want to be. But in truth, what I've seen so much over the last years is that people who think they're really far away from this place they want to be, it's generally just around the corner. It's much closer than they think. And it's like, it's not like every single facet of life needs to be turned upside down. There's a few cogs that need to be turned, which just make drastic difference in someone's life. So yeah, I, I'm fortunate that it happened in such a short time. But I mean, that's why when we were running the physical center, programs were eight to 12 weeks because we found in that time, we could really get someone turned around. Um, Cause yeah, we weren't just gonna make it one session and everyone was gonna do it the way I did it. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, uh, we, 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 we need to, cause even, cause you never know what's gonna happen. Cause obviously I stopped using drugs and felt great after that. But then by continually keep going and doing the work, because like I said, just the stopping of drugs isn't the end of the work, you know? Um, by going through that work, I then just found out that this is what I wanted to do with life and I started finding meaning and purpose. Yeah. And this is where some people can get tripped up in this world, yeah? Because what happens when you... when you here's, here's the thing. Like, If you imagine three steps, 
like whether it's mental illness, addiction, whatever it is, um, address these past traumas, address these negative patterns and these emotions that we have stored throughout our life. That's probably the most important, okay? Foster, you need, you need to surround yourself with people who are lifting you up and not bringing you down. So mm. you need to be very, very aware of your connections. Yeah, so connection is so important as us human beings and we want the right connection. Um, and the next thing is finding some sort of meaning and purpose in our life. And that doesn't have to be, I'm going to open up a fucking centre and help people. It can be, so I'm going to dedicate myself to being a great dad or I'm going to get involved in a local sports club and foster those kids or whatever it is. But we need some sort of meaning because especially with drugs or alcohol, when we first stop, recovery which i fucking hate that word but mm. recovery right recovery is like our sole purpose right so all we're doing is like i'm getting clean and i'm staying clean and our family and friends and like people who are there they're clapping us along and we're getting cheered and we get all this positive uh, affirmation from it and we're really fired up and excited and i see so many people slip up because they don't find any other purpose and what happens whether it be a few weeks a month a couple of months what will happen all of a sudden, people stop cheering now. It's like you've been clean for a couple of months. You know, it's like now that purpose that you had, if you don't find some other purpose, this is when people can now fall back into uh, old traps because their purpose became about being clean. Now I'm clean. Now what? Mm. Then we feel that there's like a void left there. And if we don't address that, we can get sucked back into these old patterns. Mm, that's such a good point. Um, you know, and I, I think... Uh, you often find that with trauma work, people get very uh, uh, addicted to this notion of there's still something down there. There's still something down there, you know, and they go and go and go, which I think is good. But I think your point is, is even more um, right. You know, we are fundamentally future oriented and it's like we can do the work, but we simultaneously need to integrate it. And there still has to be something else driving us beyond, oh yeah, or I'm healing myself. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. I think there's, there's, you do need to go back and do that work and you also have to have that future pulling you. And then you've also got to have this awareness. Yeah. So you can call it tools if you want, but this is awareness in the moment of when my thinking is getting off track and when I can pull it back on track or when I have an emotional disturbance that I can sit with and deal with, because then we stop accumulating, right? That's what, that's, that's the whole thing. Look, we don't want, it's like, you can say, oh, yeah, I went to see a psychologist every week for two years. I'm like, that's not a success. Yeah. <laughs> that's so much more than we needed, right? Because it's like it, you want to give people the tools so that they don't come back. Mm. Yeah. yeah, because it's one thing. It's like I let go of all this baggage and went back to life and accumulated more baggage. Now i got to go and address that baggage. And it's just constant back and forth, back and forth. But I think if you can help people with their trauma, but also teach them the ways ways to be with their emotional body, which is the most important, and not escape it. Let, work with that energy, not against it, not suppressing it, not escape from it. And also noticing our thought patterns, which requires, it requires an awareness. And normally when you do the trauma work, you gather this anyway, because normally we're not aware of our thoughts and emotions. All we care about is what's happening out here, right? We're, we're obsessed with what's coming in through the senses, right? But that's just one thing. So you'd imagine we, we are aware of three things in this life. We are aware of events, just things coming in through the senses. We're aware of thoughts. We're aware we have this voice up here that doesn't shut the fuck up. <laughs> and, and we're aware of our emotions. We're aware that we feel things. When I feel fear, I'm like, oh shit, I'm, I'm feel fear. So we're aware of those three things. And most people just care about events. Yeah. So what happens, they get a disturbance in their thoughts or emotional body then all they want to do is change external circumstances to make this stuff feel better. And, they, and the problem is they do it and it works to an extent, but it mm. hasn't dealt with the actual cause. So then after a while, all this stuff gets stirred up again. I'll change again. Stirred up. I'll change again. And it's just this never-ending thing that goes on. Whereas people, when you normally go to do the trauma work, you realize, oh, my whole reality is filtered through these thoughts and emotions. If I start to work with them and be in relationship to them then the way i perceive external reality starts to change you know the amount of people that i've worked with it's it's so hilarious and they're complaining about their like their wife that she has this this and this and blah 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 we do some work on their emotional baggage around relationships or their mummy issues or whatever it is they come back the next week how's things going with your wife oh mate she has changed <laughs> she's a completely different person i'm like <laughs> I'm like, she's not different. You're seeing her differently. It's so funny. Yes. Um, That's brilliant. So I think having the tools and awareness because it's like um, watching a movie. If I'm watching a movie, I realize that that movie isn't me. Yeah. And even though I get caught up in the emotions of the movie, I still have this distance from it. So we see external reality like that. Like when I look at um, two people across the street, I'm like, that's not me. Yet, 
when I look at my thoughts and emotions, they're so close, yeah, because the thoughts are kind of up here. Emotions are generally heart-based into the stomach. I just identify with them as me. As soon as I'm identified with them as me, I can't be in relationship with them and I can't actually work them. Mm. Yeah, this is what it's like. This is, I suppose, what being unconscious is all about, what is acting out unconscious thought and emotional patterns. So as soon as I then start to separate myself and see my thoughts and emotions as something out here as opposed to in here, I can be in relationship and I can work with them. Right? And that's, that's what we're talking about, like tools in the moment that we can deal with so we don't accumulate any more baggage. And then, yes, yes the purpose is important as well. Yeah, and so this is a really good point when we're talking about perception and all this sort of stuff. This is something that I, I really, um, for the moment I think we connected, I wanted to um, pick your brain about this idea of 12 steps because it was always very fascinating. And someone who I love deeply, you know, Russell Brandt, who who um, calls himself a recovering addict all the time. I was just interested in your opinions around that, especially considering we've spoken about the fact that belief systems which are illusory to a degree also influence our lives, like how that plays into the 12 step recovery program, kind of what your, your thoughts are on that. Yeah. So I said before, I'm a fan and a critic, so mm. I'll try and clarify that. I love Russell Brand as well. He's fantastic. He's a um, yeah, wonderful human being. And I, so here's the thing, 12 step has been around for a long time and it's a free service. It's a community that people can go to and get help. Like that's fucking amazing. That there's mm. a free service, right? And and like I, I know people who I was in the scene with who have done 12 step and it's saved their life. So mm. who am I to tell someone this particular thing over here saved your life? It's bullshit. I'm not, right? Because right? at the end of the day, it's whatever works for people is fantastic. Now, that's we're talking micro scale. Let's talk macro scale. It is my strong belief that for us to take addiction recovery, if I want to use that term, to the next level evolution in this or next level of consciousness, it will take something different than a 12-step approach. Okay, so I think we need to just evolve, and some of the teachings are fine. Doing inventory on your whole life and doing it, oh, there's nothing wrong with that. That's mm. fantastic. But there's a few things there that just need to be changed. Uh, the whole uh, sobriety thing is a problem. Identifying as an addict is a problem. Once again, we talk about beliefs. I'm an addict. Um, if I believe I'm an addict, though I haven't taken drugs for 10 years, that doesn't make any sense to me. This is programming for the subconscious. Renunciation, like I thought I speak you know, in spiritual circles and that kind of thing, renunciation is horseshit as well. Because the thing is, whatever I renunciate, I'm tied to for the rest of my life. Yeah, yes, absolutely. So, so, where, so whether I'm using drugs every day or I'm renouncing drugs and staying away from them every day, Drugs are controlling my life. Brilliant. Right? Okay. So that's why, yeah, renunciation I'm not a fan of. Like people are like, oh, so you, you know, people ask if I have a drink. I still have a drink. I didn't for a little bit, but now I do. It's a very different relationship to alcohol. Because once again, you address the traumas, then there's a different relationship. I used to be able to, I would start drinking and couldn't stop. And I would either drink incredibly a lot or that would lead to using drugs. Now I can have two beers and that's it. Because mm. once again, it's the internal stuff. The pain has changed. When the pain has changed, how we use things becomes very different. Um, people say, oh, so you'll never, you'll never use ice again. And it's highly unlikely <laughs> that I'll ever use ice again. But I'm like, I don't even think about it. Like, yeah. I don't think about whether or not I'm going to use drugs again because yeah. I just don't care. Like it's not on my sphere of awareness. It's like this, right? Let's say that uh, I uh, need to lose weight, but I keep eating... Uh, pizza every day <laughs> yeah right? and so i'm like i gotta lose this weight i'm gonna i'm renouncing pizza i'm going a month with no pizza what do i wake up thinking about very good and what and what do i go to sleep thinking about <laughs> yeah i mean i'm thinking about it's, it now <laughs> i'll never renounce pizza <laughs> no way <laughs> for so sure yeah, like i said that's that that whole the whole sobriety movement is very very interesting to me because there is like I said, there's so much guilt and shame as well involved with being an addict. And I think a bit of that can creep into that world as well because I know if someone, like you've got your certain amount of days clean and if you slip up, it's like, you know, you got to start your days again and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's this big, you know, guilt trip. And I, I've even heard, I'm pretty sure, like a uh, friend was telling me, I caught up with him. I might have just said, oh, do you want to grab a beer? He goes, oh, no, I can't because I'd have, have to start my days again and it's been like three years. And I'm like, but weren't you an ice addict? Is yeah, 
why can't you have a beer? Mm. It's like, nah, any any substance. Like, where, where do you draw the line? Yeah? Cigarette, coffee, can you have caffeine? Because caffeine's a psychoactive drug. Like, where do we draw the line here? Mm. You know? So, yeah, whilst it's, it's saved many lives, it's a free service, I do love it. There's just a couple of things that I think we need to reframe. And I think people are understanding addiction a lot better now because there's, there's more books being written, more people talking about this stuff. Um, myself and my friend Matt, uh, I've done a course on families of addicts. So trying to help the families understand because families just freak out mm. <laughs> because they... they what, it, what we don't understand, we are afraid of, okay? And people don't understand addiction. So the way we interact with addiction comes from a place of fear, which is just a massive problem. And I get parents or partners or people ask all the time, what do I say, what do I do? And they want like a list of the exact things to say and do. And I'm like, if you're in a state of fear because you don't understand addiction, it doesn't matter what I tell you to say, it won't work because mm-hmm. you're coming from a place of not understanding and fear. You know what, man, you know, talking about belief systems now is, you know, it's like getting down to the root of uh, phenomenological experience. You know, this is like the root of human behavior, very, very deep work. But what you're talking about, um, you know, attaching yourself to this notion of, you know, I used to be a drug addict, now I'm a recovering dot, 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 drug addict. You know, it's still got drugs in the scenario there, even though you're not using anymore. I, I was um, working with a guy who, um, you know, moved away from Christianity, you know, as another belief system, if you want to put on that same plane. And um, then he had an exp- a near death experience and then attached himself to fundamentalist Christianity and his relationship to Christianity changed, but he was still, he still met, you know, and this is obviously between us and the listeners. And I love this guy, but you know, it was still under this ceiling of Christianity as opposed to what I think you and I are talking about abstracting out under the belief system that there are belief systems that define our lives, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's a really good point you made as well, because whatever gives someone meaning and purpose, you know, obviously not including the fact that people are using that to kill people and all that. If they're, if, if we're all getting along, you know, best of luck to you. But I'm really excited about um, this evolution in consciousness where we're starting to see what belief systems look like for us all, you know, including myself. I'm constantly trying to figure out what do I believe to be true so I'm unconscious about it, you know. Um, And that kind of segues into my next question. When you're working with someone who is a recovering addict, when you're dealing with the purpose and the meaning stuff so that they can transcend this idea of, you know, drugs are in the past now, how do you help their ego, I suppose, attach to some kind of new idea of who they could be? Yeah. Well, you have to clear up the old limiting beliefs first. Um, This is where people get into trouble because people, um, they want to make these lofty goals for what they want for the future. So I'm going to do this, 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 this. And they get all these ideas. But if they still have these old beliefs that uh, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy of success, I'm not worthy of love, I'm not good enough, uh, I fear failure, I fear success. What's happening? They're just going to take their old programming, which they've used to sab- they've sabotage themselves with their whole life into these future experience. And they'll just sabotage that as well. So it's like, you have to, you have to kind of clear the decks first. Mm. So it's like, that's why, that's why it's got to be done in that order. It's like, let's get rid of all these beliefs that are causing a lot of sabotage and everything. And then once that's happened, then let's decide what purpose and meaning looks like. Cause oftentimes someone are coming like, I definitely want to do this, but then you do be clean house a bit back here. Then all of a sudden, Oh, cause, uh, we need beliefs. Like if we want to talk deeply about beliefs, it's, it's a very interesting topic because we need belief systems because it helps us generalize and give us a framework for being human. Um, the human brain, uh, one of its main objectives is to conserve energy, right? So we need these beliefs to start to generalize and stereotype, not just people, but things as well, so that we don't have to use so much energy. Otherwise, I'd have to analyze every single bit of data that came into me and that's just too much for the brain to handle. We'd be mm. in all sorts. So every belief's an illusion at the end of the day. It's like, if I believe that I'm not worthy of love, that's true. If I believe I am worthy of love, that's not true as well. So it's like, what, which illusion do I want to believe in at the end of the day? Yeah. But um, we need to sort of clean it. So what happens, there's a, a big wide world out there. Now we can never see the whole lot, like I said, because it's too much stimulus. But the more limiting beliefs we have, the more the world looks like this. It's like tunnel vision. 
we see a very limited uh, experience in the future. Yeah, because we've had so many patterns and everything happen in the far past, we just project that onto the future. So it becomes a predictable future at the end of the day. Yeah. It's like, oh, no, I'm going to, I'm not, I know this is going to happen. I'm going to do this and this, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then we get very disillusioned with life. This happens not just in drugs. This happens, it's called when Saturn returns, right? When we're around 28 years old. I, I, so many men and women actually both around that age it's like 27 to 31 that kind of age shit starts hitting the fan because we've got this data bank of experience and all these beliefs built up that everything becomes kind of so predictable we actually know how we're going to feel when we go into a certain situation so oh, i'm going to go to that party tonight I only know a few people i'll feel a bit anxious i'll have a few drinks and i'll feel okay everything becomes so predictable that life becomes mundane and we start questioning the whole point of it all right it's called when saturn returns because when we're born Look, I'm not massive into like astrology and stuff, but when it's just a good analogy, when we're born, Saturn's in a certain position in the sky and it takes around 28 years for it to come all the way around and be back in that position. So when Saturn returns, we're kind of at that point in our life. Mm. So because everything becomes so predictable, we feel like we've, you know, because when we're young, we're so excited about shit. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we want school. I'm going to do sports. I'm going to go to my mate's house. We're going to have a sleepover. We go through high school. We can't wait to get our license because that represents freedom and a, a big unknown world to us. I want to go out in the workforce and make money. We don't realize how much that sucks. <laughs> but we, we, we get, we're very excited about it. We're excited about you know going out and drinking or having drugs. We're excited about meeting girls and all this stuff. It's exciting because there's possibilities out there. And if we hit this point in our life where we're like, oh, I've done all that. Now everything's somewhat predictable, mm. right? And this is when we people start to ask these deep questions like, why am I here? Mm. <laughs> like, what is this existence? And that and that puts people in existential crisis, which then brings up a lot of their unexpressed uh, baggage throughout their whole life. So it's an interesting age. Um, mm. I don't know how we got onto that. I don't know what the question was, but we've ended up there. We have ended up there. And I think it actually um, buds like another question. How do you help people deal with that existential pain as they're moving through that process? Uh, well, you have to frame the experience for them because yeah. they see it as a really bad thing. I see it as a fantastic thing. Spiritual Why breakthrough. People come in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. That's, that's the... So what happens? They come in and they'll say this. They'll say, I don't know who I am anymore. I'm like, Great. Yeah, we're on. <laughs> They're real depressed. They're depressed. I'm like, whoo. Here we go. And then I'll say something like, I just want to go back to the way I was. And we're like, no. No, 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 no. Yeah, we don't want to go back to the way we were because the way you were has led you to being here. Mm. Yeah. This, this takes an actual breaking down of the personality and the ego to rebuild something that's going to create more fulfillment. Mm. So it is an uncomfortable process because you have to break down parts of yourself that have been holding on for so long. It's all like we've exhausted so many options in life the will the ego has exhausted so many options that it's like oh i've got nothing else yeah and then this is when this crisis comes on so it's just breaking down and rebuilding but you've got to re one of the things i do is just reframe that experience because as soon as they see it as a good thing and they understand that they if they do the work what's on the other side of it they get a bit of juice they get a little bit fired up because the last thing you want is someone in complete apathy because then they just haven't got the juice to do the work that's required but it's very important to, to yeah, reframe that experience for people Mm, mm, God, yeah, it, it it absolutely is, and it's um, it's funny how we we develop these um these ideas around breakdowns and 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 breakthroughs. I, I was wondering just to kind of finish up, and I don't want to, <laughs> but the I like if you could, given what you know now, dude, how would you kind of change the educational system so that we can better you know, be better prepared for this, this idea, you know, this inevitable ego death, you know, all, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. It's uh, teaching kids to accept or teaching kids about emotions, teaching kids to be with themselves and teaching kids uh, to completely accept whatever state they're in. We get into so much problems because mm -hmm. we have been indoctrinated from when we're young that uh, we sh if we're feeling not great or emotional, whatever it is that we shouldn't accept that. And yeah. that's the problem. Like that's the problem. Like with someone, like you said, like these words breakdown and breakthrough, like they help describe it, but they're, they're a complete um, non-acceptance of the reality of what's happening. Yeah. Like it's, we, we, we are so bad as humans at just accepting what this experience is mm. of being human. We, we resist and resist and resist. So I think, yes, if it, I mean, 
my job has been mostly about uh, repairing myself, who was a broken adult, and repairing other broken adults. So how do we change that? So we try and have less broken adults. Yeah. And I think we do that by teaching kids very, very young emotional intelligence, what emotions are, how we be with emotions, how we be in relationship with emotions, in turn, how to be with ourselves, okay? Because that's you know, a great quote. One of man's great problems is the fact that he can't sit in a room by himself for an extended period of time, right? <laughs> we need distractions, yeah? So it's like if we just teach kids this at a very, very young age, then we stop so much of the broken adults because the, the issues we run into is an accumulation of emotional baggage, mm. okay? When an emotion comes up, we do one of three things that doesn't deal with the emotion, right? We suppress it. That's the classic. When that emotion comes up, we're like, get back yeah. down, right? We escape. This was my uh, expertise. We'll generally be good in, in one of these areas, but mine was escaping. As soon as that emotion came up, bang, uh, drugs, alcohol, gym, like even healthy, you know, addictions. Nice one. Um, yeah, well, that's the thing. Like I used to go to the gym obsessively, weigh every gram of my food, like I remember I would weigh out boiled chicken breast and I needed uh, 250 grams and it was 249 and I'd cut a little bit to make sure it was the 250. Like that's fucking crazy. <laughs> anyway, right? So, so what happens is it's obsessively trying to escape because the gym would help me not feel those emotions. So we escape or we project. That's when an emotion comes up. We just want to throw it at someone else. Let, let, me, let, me, let someone else take it because I don't want to. What happens, one awesome. of those three things mean that the intensity of the motion will go down, but it won't leave our body. It'll just hum in the background. You would imagine we've got an invisible backpack on when we're younger. Every time we go through life and something emotional happens and we don't process and let it go and take the feedback, we throw something in that, we throw it in that backpack. And over time, that thing gets heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier, right? And sometimes we will let stuff go, but generally more stuff's going in that's coming out. So the load increases throughout our life. When that load gets very, very heavy, that will show up in some people as depression, as some people as anxiety, in some people as borderline personality, as some people as bipolar, some people as drug addiction, some as alcoholism, right? It's like, this is all surface stuff, yeah? Mainstream, the system now looks at everything as it's its own problem, but it's just feedback of this deeper stuff that we've got going on. And so if we can mm -hmm. teach kids how to not fill up their backpack and how to, if they feel like it's starting to get full, right? If you've got the tools and the awareness when you're young how to do this stuff, oh my God, the way that it changed society is incredible. But then also teaching kids that if that thing is getting full, they feel completely safe to reach out and speak to someone, especially parents, then you got to imagine or the backpacks of millions of people being so much lighter. Mm -hmm. Imagine what, what we could do then. Well, imagine what we could do then as a society. We've all got light backpacks. So the problem is the more heavy our backpack is, the more we're obsessed with ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. If I'm weighed down by this thing, all I can think about is, fuck, this is heavy. I need mm. to try and stop this. If my backpack's light, I'm all of a sudden thinking about other people. How can I help this person? How can I help that person? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, even just, uh, you know, relating that to my own experience with little things as a child, um, you know, you don't have to be like, you know, your first day of school, you don't, you don't have to be afraid. Like little things like that. Yeah. But it's just like, I'm starting not to trust the way I'm feeling because I shouldn't be feeling like this. That makes a lot of, that makes so, dude, this, ha honestly, I do not say this lightly because I've done a lot of podcasts. This has to be one of the most informative ones I've ever done. Seriously. The way, I think the way. Do you say that, do you say that to all the girls, Tom? I say that to all the girls. Um, I say that to I actually say that to every get no, I'm <laughs> I just think that the way I'm, you, I'm not, my, my ego isn't offended if you do Tom. Yes, absolutely. Well, it should be. <laughs> no, the, the way you describe <laughs> these things um, is brilliant, man. And I think the, the I think what it helps the most with is um, breaking down the taboo and the fear associated with being trauma informed and doing the work because you know, this is at the root of every issue. If we really are comfortable being who we are and that's fine, we're just get that. I mean, what, you know, abstract that out to uh, inner peace, world peace. If we're all happy. Yeah, that's the saying, hurt people, hurt people. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah, mate. No, um, no, one, no one who's happy and content wants to go out and try and be little or hurt in other human beings. The less, the less hurt people there are, um, the, more, the more love. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Dude, can you give us um, some book recommendations, like three to five of the ones that have really kind of shaped your, your view of this sort of stuff? 
Uh, I love The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. Um, books are funny. Books are... It, it depends on the, the book at the right time, true. You know, all that Very kind of true. jazz. Uh, but that, that book spoke to me at, at an important time for me. So The Untethered Soul, Michael Singer. Um, let me think, let me think. I, I think Johan Hari's books, we mentioned him. So Chasing the Scream about the war on drugs, about how completely fucking ridiculous a war on drugs is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a good one. Also Lost Connections, his book about depression, um, which I think uh, sheds a lot of light on mm. why we, if I went down the street and started asking people randomly what causes depression, then the vast majority will say it's a chemical imbalance and namely a serotonin deficiency, which has never, ever been proven to be correct. Science. Yeah. <laughs> God. <laughs> marketing, the mar- marketing strong. Um, very good. Yeah, yeah, those ones. Some of Dr. Joe Dispenza's books, mainly probably Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself mm. is a good one. And yeah, that'll do. That's brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. And yeah, they are great books. Um, um, and The Alchemist, for, for, a, for a non, like, you know, non-fiction one, The Alchemist is a beautiful story. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Coelho, very good. Yeah. Now, you're doing a lot of work yourself here, mate. And, um, you know, if we can, if people put, can, excuse me, if people can have access to your brain, um, you've got the podcast, you've got the, um, the coursework. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how to find you and what's coming up as well? Yeah, so the Center for Healing on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Um, yeah, we do a fair bit of content on there. Uh, what Woke Blokes podcast on uh, all the podcast uh, places. Brilliant. And, and website, so the Center for Healing, .com.au, or all the core stuff is courses.thecenterforhealing.com.au. Um, you better find that stuff on socials if you can't. So um, you can shoot us a DM through any of those channels if you want to chat. And yeah, we practitioner training me and myself mel are also still doing single sessions with people who are struggling uh over zoom and obviously the online courses and that kind of jazz but uh yeah a dm through the socials is probably the uh the easiest way best way to do it brilliant and mate um just some practical advice for someone who you know i suppose this really resonated with whether they've they're trying to get some trauma work happening they think they might be addicted you know subjectively speaking what like what's like one tool that they could do right now Apart from obviously reach out to you. <laughs> I, was about, I was about to say message me. Yes, um, that's right. Because, because what happens, the, the, you said something interesting. It's like if, if this resonated. So what happens when people are struggling with stuff, we tend to get in this state where there's no hope. And so the first step is how do I actually instill some hope into my life? And it's like you need to get stories in front of people of people who've overcome something similar to what you've overcome. Because nice. all of a sudden, if we see that, it's like an N of one. It's Because like, that's what I thought. I'm like, hang on. That's, there's, I can find one person who's overcome ice addiction. And if I find one, and then I can fucking do it. I'm human, they're human, right? We just, we just need that belief. So I would say if, if there's no hope, we've got to get stories in front of people of people who've overcome this stuff. Um, and then mm. obviously reach out to those people. Um, That's cool. For, yeah, I will, one really practical step is if someone is struggling, just start off by opening up to someone whether in someone you feel comfortable with. And even if it scares you, do it anyway. Whether it's a family member, a really, really good friend, um, a partner, that kind of thing. But um, what happens, we're so, so scared of being vulnerable because if we feel we're being vulnerable, then we're going to get judged. And if we get judged for expressing who we really are, because that's the stuff we're trying to hide, (laughs) who we really are, then we feel so open that we're going to, um, it'll be too much for us to handle. But every time someone is vulnerable, they're generally welcomed with open arms. We get the opposite reaction to what we think. You know, I always tell people, imagine if your friend came to you and opened up and told you about all this stuff, would you belittle them? But no, I'd fucking hug them and try and help them. Good, good. Good. They do that for you. So fucking open up. (laughs) Yeah, man. That's, that's brilliant. Absolutely. Uh, mate, you know, I I just want to take this time to thank you for the, for the time, you know, you gave us for the show today. You know, we haven't, um, met too much outside of the world, but your wisdom is like every time that we chat, I learned something new um, from you, man. I really, really appreciate that. So thank you so much for doing the show. Mate, it's a pleasure. Are we recording or not? I think, I hope we're recording. <laughs> even, even if we're not, who the fuck cares? That was brilliant. <laughs> it's brilliant, mate. No, a pleasure, Tom. I, I appreciate you. I appreciate uh, you having me on and I'm looking forward to continuing the friendship in the future. Mm, absolutely, man. Lots, uh, 
lots to come, lots to come. Guys, thanks so much for listening to the show. Peace. Talk soon.